shit. I think Carlin might call in right now. She, I got her to read Day of the Rope. Guys, I got Carlin to read Day of the Rope. She said she read it today. And she's going to call in and give a book review on Day of the Rope. Let's go. My name is Shuby, and you should get naked, and we should make a movie. Bitch, my name is Shuby. You're kind of a cutie, and I want your booty. Bitch, my name is Shuby. The why? This is Handsome the Truth. Why? It's a boss in La Casa, and I got it from Ross. Ho, floss with the watch that I got from Costco. Oh, no. Bro. Oh, there you go again with them low blows. You want to take my dough? Double bitch, that's a no-no. She better than so-so. Do it pro bono. Not on DVD yet, but we're making a porno. She like my hair short, but better in cornrows. She said she get wetter when I'm grabbing a torso. I'm cooler than an icicle. Ride him like a bicycle. Threesome on tricycles. The sex is phenomenal. I can't Boom believe that's handsome too. Some find a comical. See, these guys are all just eat, fame whores, man. In a chronicle. I'm Mr. Minotio. That's my real name. My claim to fame is fuck your name and sniff your paint. So on that note, you better guide your hoe. Let's go, Carlos. Go. Bitch, my name is Shuby, and what I like to do, rap about those hoochies. Bitch, my name is Carlin B. And you should get Hello. And we should make a Hello. Bitch, this is obviously is a horrible idea. Kind of a and is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're about to announce live on air that you read Day of the Rope. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I read stuff like that before. I guess it's not the first time. Yeah, so. you just it's it's research. It was for research. That's exactly it. It was for research. You gotta find out what the crazy people are doing. I mean, like the reason I even read it is I've been I, I like I read the Turner Diaries in college, mm. and um and I've been thinking a lot about that book lately in terms of like, you know, would would I perceive it differently today? Because obviously when I was in college I was like a leftist, and um, no, I was never like crazy left, but like I was I was on the left, and so like I I like you know part of me in co- like I liked the book, but I also I hated it, but I liked it because I just like kind of dystopian stuff like that and like kind of like the the more morbid the better um so i wanted to reread the turner diaries to find out if i feel differently about it now than i did then and when i mean this book kind of seemed like day of the rope seemed basically a lot like the turner diaries yeah to me (laughs) yeah yeah you can write hunter as well if you want to do another one there's another one called hunter i think that was pierce who wrote hunter um it's another it's another one like that uh I never heard of that one. Did William Pierce write Hunter? Who? Yeah, it's Pierce. William Pierce read, read Hunter. Um, it's another one in the genre, similar. All right. I have to say, I was a little, I was a little disappointed in Day of the Rope because, like, I, I wanted, I wanted more, and I started actually rereading the Turner Diaries after I, I finished reading Day of the Rope. And I was like, see, this is what I wanted. <laughs> Mm. I felt like it ended without giving me what I wanted. You know what I mean? Uh, Day of the Rope did? Yeah. I read it, maybe it was 2018. So I have sort of almost like a foggy memory. It's like five or six years ago. I remember the gist of it. Um, I might even refresh if I was going to really have a conversation about it. But what are some takeaways? What Can you remind me maybe some of the significant plot lines and points and like what went down i so essentially there was a list that was created online of like right. just like all the people that are um ruining all of society and it was kind of like this like you know crowdsource thing where they had all this like evidence and receipts and they knew exactly who these people were even if they weren't like the public face of it or whatever and so there were bounties that were put kind of like on, on their head in crypto where if you you know, kill these people to get them off the list, then you got like, you know, a million dollars or whatever, however much yeah. people had put up, depending on like the value of the target. And so then people kind of like would take it upon themselves to like, you know, submit a contract or whatever, and then go and do the thing. And, you know, slowly they started kind of like picking off these targets. And then like the, uh, the people that are used to running the show kind of got wind of this and they were like, what the hell's going on? No one's allowed to do this shit, but us. And it was kind of like, you know, what I did, what I did like about Day of the Rope, there's one quote specifically towards the beginning. I took a screenshot of it. Hang on. What is it? What is it? The red pill is there are no laws. The laws are just self-imposed limitations we put on ourselves. If you really want to beat them, you have to free yourself from these imaginary boundaries and this moral code that was designed to keep us in line and start playing on their level. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and like I, I got that, and that that seems like pretty relevant, honestly. Um, yeah. And obviously, I would never advocate killing people. I think that's wrong and bad, and it's against the non-aggression principle, obviously. But like <laughs> the whole idea of like, um, you know, questioning like why are these people allowed to do something, but we aren't allowed to do it, and you know, all this stuff is just controlled by these elite people that really can do whatever the fuck they want, and uh, we're not allowed to kind of like fight back or like people just LARP about fighting back, which I thought was. Like, like, oh shit! No, I was, I was just, I was about to confuse Day of the Rope and Turner Diaries. I just read a part in the Turner Diaries where, like, in the very beginning, they were talking about like the gun confiscation raids and about how like the people who were loudest, like, you will never take my guns, were like the first to give their guns up in that book. And I was like, that's mm. actually exactly what would happen with conservatives. Um, but so yeah, Day of the Rope. Um, like, so the basically the elites start to get wind of like what's going on. And they start to get, and they're like, who the fuck is even doing this? Um, and they're trying to figure out who's actually doing it. And then um, they, the last kind of thing is like, they commit this big terrorist act to contaminate all the water in California and attack the electrical grid and stuff. And yep. um, then the one guy that was involved, like ends up getting like stabbed by a crazy leftist lunatic in the hospital. And his final act is he is set on a timer to, upload to the world to inspire everyone else to you know fight back and all this stuff so mm -hmm. that's it yeah you know what i, I really that i want you to read hunter too there's actually a, there's a, a whole other angle that goes on in hunter i just remembered where the dude actually starts uh he becomes him and his little gang they come up with this plan to basically prop one of the guys up who's really good at this type of thing basically as a televangelist and he becomes like an extremely really? popular uh like fake televangelist but then after he builds this big old congregation and does like uh kind of scam healings and the whole thing then he uses that big platform to then start red pilling them on on race and israel and he activates his entire congregation into like extremists and they use it to, to they even um yeah, but there's like he does things with he goes and bombs little meetings and sneaks in places with propane tanks and sets them up to explode little council meetings and starts doing these little hits. And but he starts off small time and he's just like shooting black people from his car <laughs> in the parking lot. And stuff. <laughs> it's like crazy. But then he finds other people and it goes, ends up in this big old adventure of like these uh, these people who are like we're the only ones who see what needs to be done and they're. It's like a, it's a fantasized story about how people could start running ops to make things happen. And I think that's why it's kind of a blacklisted book because it puts the wrong, wrong thoughts in people's minds. But, and it's uh it's very racist, but it's all uh, anti-establishment yeah, against the government and all that. I feel like I'm on some sort of list now that I read. Oh, I remember oh, when I read the Turner diaries in college, like I found like a PDF on the internet or something. And I was like, I was like, I'm definitely going to get put on some sort of watch list just for having this PDF, like even on my <laughs> Yeah, don't let them catch you with life. it. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. If that's on your hard drive. Oh, man. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. She's collecting you know what's uh, funny? radical propaganda. What? I mean, I, but I have been doing this stuff for a long time. So, like, whatever, whatever. But you know what's funny is like, so, um, so I've been looking. I know I have a copy of Mein Kampf somewhere in my house and I cannot find it. And I know, I know I have it because I had it when I lived in Vermont and it got put in some box somewhere, or some drawer when I moved to New Hampshire and it's never been seen again. And I've been Ooh. desperately looking for this damn book because I read it a long time ago and I wanted to look at it again. And um, I cannot find it anywhere and you can't buy it anywhere now. Like I, I was able like when I bought it back in the day and we're talking like, I don't know, like 15 years ago or so 15, 20 years ago or something like that. Like like I bought it off of Amazon, I think. Yeah. And you can't even get it anywhere anymore. Isn't that weird? You yeah. just can't buy it. I said that like, on stream I mean, the other day a... and somebody was like, no, you can still buy it. You could buy it on in Barnes and Noble. I don't know if that's true. I didn't get I mean, to try. I mean, I haven't looked like in Barnes and Noble, but I, I, I started, I was like, after I was searching for days for this goddamn book and I was like, why don't I just buy another copy of it? Like, this is actually like, I'm actually now spending more time than it would cost, like it would cost me just to buy a new copy and I couldn't find it for sale anywhere. Hmm. Hey, question from my chat. Carlin, explain how it violates the non-aggression principle. 
In the non-aggression principle, you literally go take retribution when you are aggressed on. Because there is a definition of aggressed and, and it's not like, you know, someone in some elitist organization does something somewhere that might trickle down and affect me in some way. It actually means someone aggresses upon you. And so I guess you could rationalize it and say, like, these people, like, we're at war with these people or, like, whatever the book says. And, you know, they, they violated the non-aggression principle first. But if, like, they haven't done anything to you because the non-aggression principle is about, like, individualism. It's not about collectivism. It's not about, like, they did something to your group. If they don't do something to you, then you are technically violating it if you aggress against them but if they're if they're like on your property and they're trying to hurt you and they're trying to take your stuff then you have every right to shoot them with however many guns that you have and that's that's fine but if they haven't done anything to you you can't do anything to them what if they send a drone with like a with a dangling claw and it goes it flies over your property and steals your child and they do it from their property and they aren't technically the one that did it and it, it wasn't they didn't actually hurt you. They just took your kid. Can you go then well, take retribution? I mean, they're aggressing on your property at that point because kids are kind of like a form of property in this ideology, I guess. So they but are if, aggressing on you. If, they're taking your they're, property. Go get your property back. Right. But if they're moving into uh, systems of influence and politics and boards and they're propagandizing people around you and setting up scams to like bilk, bilk old people out of their money and doing usurious debt scams and stuff like that, that's not the same. That, it gets a little that foggy. Would not fall, yes, that would not fall under the... Uh, the non-aggression principle because they haven't aggressed on you directly. Right. If they just went and dug a hole and covered it with leaves and a tarp and had like spikes in the bottom, then you fell into the hole. Well, that was your fault. Now you can't go kill them for that. They just dug a hole and put spikes. They set a trap yeah. that you fell into. <laughs> you can't, you can't get revenge for that. Now your there fault. is something to be said for the idea though. Like and if, it wasn't if, on your property. It was living... out on, on the road. Well, but there is something to be said for the idea of like, if you're in, like a libertarian, like a voluntarist libertarian community and people are coming in and aggressing against the community, the community can expel those people. I mean, it can be like, get the fuck out. We don't want to associate with you. You are, you are no longer welcome here. And so that's, that would be allowed because you're in a voluntarist community. But what if they paid to have some of their people into the board of that community who makes the decisions and they won't let you? Then what do you do? Well, that's a, that's a that's a problem. Yeah, then you get a problem. Yeah, uh, they're saying in my chat. Okay, it's, so then you allow many indirect abuses. Yeah, that's a problem. What do you do about all these indirect abuses? I mean, I think it probably depends on what the indirect abuse is, and yeah, and then you got to get then you got to convince everybody in your group, in your squad, and your gang, these people are doing something to our group. They're doing something to our gang. And they're abusing us. And they're not going to stop. They're unwilling. In fact, they're doing it on purpose. We got to do something about it. But you got to get everybody to agree. Well, I mean, I mean, New Hampshire is trying to secede from the United States for specifically this reason. We're working on getting everyone to agree to it. That's crazy. I mean, it, there was a poll that they did a couple of years ago that 50, over like 50 percent of Republicans, like something like 53 percent of Republicans in the state of New Hampshire are currently OK with seceding from the union. That's Democrats, nuts. not quite quite there yet, but that's actually like a really huge number. I mean. We had uh, we had we had hearings on this in our state. Well, not a, it's just nuts. Like, I mean, that would only be bad for New Hampshire and it's impossible. Like the federal government wouldn't let it happen. It's like. We want it though. Well, so what? You're not gonna get there. It. There, are, there are people in New Hampshire who've gamed all this out though, and they seem. Oh. I mean, like who knows what would happen? I guess, but they really have. There are people that have like gamed all this out. They've gamed out kind of like every possibility. What do we do about it? How do we negotiate it? I mean, they're libertarians. They're like autistic AF. This is what they do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know people who've gamed out. You know, I know autistic people who are convinced that the Earth's flat. They've gamed it all out. 
Well, that's a different thing. They've isn't got it? it figured out. They, <laughs> gravity is something else, and satellites come from balloons, and uh, everything's all conspiracy. And they've gamed it all out. They got to figure it figured out. Space is fake. There's a hole in the middle of uh, the North Pole that goes to the underworld where the angels and demons come and go from the other dimension. They've got they've gamed it all out, <laughs> and you can't talk them out of it. They are sure that they're right. So it's very. Is oh, everyone autistic now? Um, by autistic, do you mean retarded? No, I mean like yes. I feel like everyone is autistic now. Um, I feel like there was there was a time when I was not autistic, and then I had to learn to be autistic to deal with all the autistic people that I'm surrounded by, like all the time. I think aut autism gets overused pretty hard. I don't know. Did you see any of those streams that I did about the autistic dating show? Um, I saw that love, you did it. I, love I, on the spectrum. I, I, saw, I saw that you were watching it. I was like, I can't watch this. I feel like I'm making fun of like retards. I can't. I can't. Like I felt bad. It was great. Now we loved them. They were very lovable retards. But we found that we they're just like they were cool. We liked them. But they, but they're just like. Like that was actual autism, assuming that those weren't just actors acting autistic, but they were like, it, it hinders their life and they, they just, they, they're, they're missing part of themselves that allows them to be social, to read social cues. They don't like literally don't understand sarcasm. They are hyper-focused on one thing. They also have like physical, they look autistic. They're weird. They, they got a. They got a disorder. They are disordered. But then you meet internet people. Internet people, we call them autistic. And, you know, you can call it Asperger's or whatever. But and I've even known some of them that are truly autistic, have true Asperger's syndrome. And they're, I don't even know anymore. It's a good question that you're asking. Is everybody autistic? Maybe. I mean, we all, especially of our generation and the ones after, we all got vaccinated to hell and we've been drinking microplastics forever. And maybe, maybe we're all just tweaked out. Maybe we're not even normal people anymore. I'm really starting to think that like everyone is autistic and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating about that. Did you see a couple of weeks ago, I, um, I, I infiltrated this uh, conference put on by Cal like the California Community College System, and this conference was like beamed into every community college in California. So congratulations, you paid for this. And mm -hmm. um, at the conference, there was a presentation in which one of the presenters, and she's like a clinical psychologist PhD student at the University of Southern California. Um, she did this presentation where she literally said, all autistic kids are inherently queer biologically. <laughs> he sent it to you. There's video. <laughs> what do they mean by that? Like sexually queer, or just does she does she is she redefining queer to mean like asocial or something? Well, she's defining. I mean, queer is anything that goes against the normal or the legitimate or the dominant. That is just like anything that essentially goes against the norm. It's a far left political ideology. So she's, I mean, essentially saying like, so I think how she's using it is like everyone who's autistic is non-binary or gender queer or gender fluid. So mm. it's pushing back on like gender specifically. But she also says that, um, that to have autism, you you like having autism is like having a certain type of gender. It, it like having autism is a gender identity. So mm. it's called audi gender. Um, audi gender is a gender identity in which one feels that their gender is connected to their autism. I kind of actually give a little credence to that because my theory is that actually everybody who's queer is actually just autistic, like queer. <laughs> is autism a lot of them are so i don't think i don't know if autism means queer but i think queer is i don't think everybody who's autistic is queer but i think everybody who's queer is autistic i think it's actually like and it's maybe not even exactly autism but it's like that it's like a type of retardation and, and maybe even more like ocd i think the trans people by the way i think they have something that's more like ocd where it's a compulsive upset like you know, OCD people, they have to like tap the door handle a few times before they can turn it or they have a certain type of itch that they have to scratch all the time that's sort of psychological to them. 
They just have to do this thing. Otherwise, they're uncomfortable. They just, like, can't stand it. And I think these people who are fixated with switching their sex, I think it is like a compulsive disorder, like OCD. And I think I have compassion for them on that level, but I think that's what trans is. It's like a hyper fixation on their sex and the other sex and wanting to switch where they live with a weird discomfort. We used to call it uh, gender dysphoria, but I think that's actually just a type of obsessive compulsive disorder. I think there's something to that. I also think that... um. I, I think that you're right in a lot of cases where there's like ge uh, genuine gender dysphoria or whatever. There are also cases, though, where like a lot of the male to female trans people, it's just they're autogonophiliacs. It's a sexual fetish. Right. Yeah, totally. So and maybe there's overlap to that and maybe there's not. I don't know. But there is um, certainly something to the idea that like so schools are specifically targeting um, autistic kids to push gender ideology on them to convince them that because they feel weird or abnormal um, during puberty, which, I mean, of course, an autistic, I mean, anyone's going to feel weird during puberty, but, like, an autistic kid is going to feel especially weird um, because they are. Um, mm -hmm. Like, that that's an indication that you're not the gender that uh, you were born as. Um, right. They teach that, like, uh, that 75% of kids um, that have autism are non-binary or genderqueer. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And this is like in their school curriculum. They have an entire sex ed curriculum designed around it that's really crazy. One of the craziest uh like things I ever like infiltrated was autistic sex education where they're talking about teaching kids like autistic kids how to masturbate when their parents don't want to like talk about it or they're teaching them how to use sex toys and they're teaching them how to talk dirty and all this stuff and it it was a crazy presentation. It might be true. You know, honestly, uh, we might uncover it the same way we're uncovering a lot of stuff now about what happened uh, in the past, where they orchestrate certain things and there's false flags and stuff that they uh, that seemed like a, a natural outcome, but it was actually brought about on, on purpose. I wonder if we're going to find and just find the trail and figure out who it was and how they did it 10 or 20 years from now. We're going to find out, oh, they turned us all autistic and gay and trans on purpose like they mm -hmm. they knew how to do it they figured it out in the 50s they ran the op that's what chemtrails were or that's what certain thing was and they just that's why all the kids turned trans and autistic and that's what was in well, the yeah. vaccines and like they fucking just poisoned us and just turned us into like a proto cyber humans and the, the the brave new world that they want to take us all into where it's like a a weird uh cyber human or post human whatever like the first thing they had to do was just like androgenize us or whatever yeah you know one of the weird things is and this is a story i covered last year um actually almost a shit i cannot believe it's been a year since i did this story so last year i randomly discovered just by like digging through the website at like tufts university or whatever that they were running studies on non-binary three-year-olds and they had a whole center dedicated to yeah. like studying they was so it was three to eight year olds, but they were like very, very young kids. That, um, and they were like ha bringing, like having parents bring these kids in, and they were reading them stories, and they were giving them tests, and they were like talking to them and things. And like at the time, I was like, "Why the ever loving f are they studying non binary three year olds?" And the only thing I could come up with is like they're trying to reverse engineer how to put these ideas into kids' brains, essentially, because like if they can figure out like what makes kids, I guess, feel this way when they're really, really young, then that's stuff that they can start inserting into like childcare programs and like, you know, kindergarten curriculum and like stuff like that. And then as I kept digging into this study, I found that the guy leading the center that's doing this study is also working with this school in New York where last year they launched a middle school just for trans and non-binary kids. And yeah. that guy's on the advisory board for that school. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, I heard an interesting, uh, this uh, bio psychologist, I don't remember what she was, but this person who was really tapped in and knew what she was talking about. And um, she was like, uh, she was probably in her 60s and she had like this long credentialed career of research. Anyway, she was talking about the differences in our hormone levels and specifically this podcast she was in 
was focusing on the collapse of testosterone in the population and our sperm counts are going down, our testosterone is going like off of a cliff and it affects his, it affects boys and girls equally. Like it's a hormonal balance problem happening in the youth and it's, I didn't know this, but you can measure it, an effect in an infant. And the way they measure it, by the way, it was weird. It's They measure the length of the taint. Like literally the distance <laughs> between the butthole and the ball sack or whatever, that little piece of skin. If you have a certain amount of, the, of testosterone present during the pregnancy, I think it was like shorter or longer. I don't remember which one. But they can actually, like, based on the length of the taint of the infant, they can predict with pretty good accuracy if it's going to turn out gay. Like, there, it's literally related to all sorts of different things that are going to be experienced by that kid and their psychology and their life and their demeanor and everything. You can measure the length of an infant's taint to tell, like, if, whether or not it's going to be basically uh, a masculine boy or a, f- a femme boy. It's weird. That's really weird. Yeah, it was really weird. And she talked about uh, how uh, things, everything from microplastics and um, seed oils and all these things are like absolutely suppressing normal hormone production. And it's really feminizing our whole population and our sperm counts all fucked. And we're just like dying. We're dying off bad. We're becoming yeah, I mean, did, mixed gender. Didn't I see some story that like all men have like microplastics in their balls now or something? Something like that, yeah. You see stores, this? Yeah, I saw that too. Yep. Huh. Stores up in the test. We all have plastic testicles. Congratulations. Welcome to the future. <laughs> Very based. But what we're going to yeah, have to do, so we'll, much... we'll probably start okay, overcoming it with some sort of weird cyber hijack, though. We'll all get nano uh, cyber uh, uplinks implanted. What is, what's it called? Uh, the nano link or neuro link. Elon's Neuralink, we'll get that implanted or we'll get a little chip put under our skin that's measuring our plastic levels and our our T levels and then we'll get some sort of like serum that gets injected that the AI tells us and it whips up a cocktail in order to fix us And but in order to receive our injections we'll have to approve the terms of service for living in the cyber dystopia or whatever. We'll have to keep, keep in good standing with our social credits and uh, not transgress any of the TOS of the civilization. Otherwise, you get sent to the gulag. And you don't I get I think your there's serum. a Black Mirror episode about that. Yeah. It feels like, like we're literally going there. <laughs> All right. They're asking for me there. in the chat to remind you that the next thing you need to read is the oh, God. Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I've heard about this. Wasn't there some sort of movie about this or something? Can I watch a movie about it instead? I feel like I've seen this. <laughs> I don't think there's a movie. If there was, I would watch no, it. No, there's no movie. It's oh. not that long of a read, but you'll find it, you know, they'll want to, they want to tell us that it's been debunked, that it was a forgery. They've been telling us that for decades. Oh, that was all just a scam. It's like an anti-Semitic literature. Somebody made up to try to make look, Jews look like international bad guys. Are you sure there's not a movie? I feel like I've seen the, them talk about this in a movie. I don't know. If you find it, send it to me. <laughs> but what's crazy is that if it is a forgery, it just happens to line up exactly with what we're experiencing in the world. And it was predicted many decades ago. And it was, it's portrayed though, that this is the plan of the inter- international Jew basically. And um, what's in it? Well, basically that they are going to move into certain, uh, it's just, it, it, it's, it's actually like a transmission between one group and another group explaining their master plan for international control. And they get into academia and the media and the banks and the governments through these types of means. And then they set up different polarized political systems through funding this and funding that. And then eventually they set up a world war between, uh, Islam and Christianity and, like uh, it's it like spells out everything we've experienced in the last century. Mm. It's really weird. I should right. read it. To be some video. Video. Yeah, I read it like ten years ago. Should should we start an extremist book club? 
Uh, yeah, I would actually, actually do that, I and I'm not so. even joking about that. I would do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that would actually be really cool. I've been thinking about it too. I wonder if we could do interesting book reviews. I just finished. Well, actually, I'm, I'm at the end, but I, Adam uh, Green had me read a book called Nailed by David Fitzgerald. Um, I think it should have a better title. It would have been better with a better title. But it's called Nailed. It's about Jesus. Um, dude, it's like endless fucking slam dunks on the historicity of Jesus. Like it's like every sentence is just another, like, Holy shit. He's just, the whole book is boom, 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 boom. Here's all the problems with the Bible is specifically the Jesus part. Like it's all of the historical act, um, historicity of Jesus. He calls it all into question and just debunks the fuck out of like everything that we think is, is a real um, legit sighting of Jesus being a historical person. And then it breaks down the authors. Well, how come this author knew this and this one didn't, even though this one came first and this one came from the, I couldn't even like give you a recap on it, but if you listen to it, you'll just, I mean, that's what I, I'm rebuilding the deck on my house. It was out there all day today, but I just had it on as an audio book and I'm just casually listening through it going like, especially somebody who studied the Bible, like the whole first 20 years of my life, I was like in Bible studies going to church and I was being groomed to be a pastor. Like I did a semester at Bible college before I dipped out of there. And like, I was, uh, so anyway, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. went to Bible school. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I got my, well, I don't want to say which I, I went to, I received my, po, my, uh, my bachelor's degree from a Christian college. And, um, wow. Yeah, man, I was raised, my parents met in Bible study. Okay. And I was conceived on the honeymoon. I was born into a Christian family and my dad went to Bible college and I was like raised in Bible study. So I know the Bible pretty, damn. I know the Bible better than Catholics do, by the way, because Catholics don't know it because they don't really care about the Bible. They care about like the Pope and the sacrament and their faith and the creed and stuff like that. But the, but the Protestants with a sola scriptura theology that they have, it's literally, they know everything they know about God comes from the Bible. It's just based on the Bible and faith. They don't need the church. So they study the fuck out of the Bible. So I know the Bible forward and backward, left and right, and like really, really good compared to most people. So for me, reading through this book, I'm just like, it's 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 wild how kind of apparent it is, but I was never able to see it because I was always being fed a narrative about the Bible that is all like encased in the idea that it's sacred and it's from God and it's holy and it's true, and all of that is presupposed. And then the the curriculum that I'm taught, or you know, the the Bible study commentary I'm receiving is from somebody who believes it, and they're they have an agenda, and they're like they're linking together this and that in a way that makes it seem like it flows and it relates and it's totally good. But if you just take all of that away and then just textually analyze it. There's incredible problems, like blatantly obvious, huge problems. I don't know. Do you have any background like that? Did you ever study the Bible as a younger person? I studied the Bible when, and by the way, Adam Green told me to read that book too, because it's already in my audible library. I just haven't done it yet. Mm. Um, but like, so I got, um, I was, I was not raised in a religious family. My, my parents both went to Catholic school and um, they both come from like Catholic families, but both of them kind of like, you know, like my father uh, is an atheist. My mother is more like agnostic, but I didn't actually know that growing up because they, they felt very strongly that they didn't want to put religion on us like it had been put on them. So they just never talked about it. And we just didn't go to church. And we were kind of like the black sheeps of the family for that. Um, so I didn't really even look at the Bible until right after I graduated from college and I had moved home mm. and I was working at this military school in Vermont. And I think I was just kind of bored more than anything else. And I'd always been kind of like fascinated like my grandmother had read me Bible stories growing up, like Bible stories were like my favorite kind of like kids books growing up. And my, um, you know, so I, I was kind of like fascinated just from the story aspect. And so I started learning about like the, well, I guess like what I thought was the historical Jesus, but maybe that's all being called into question now. And so I was reading the Bible. I was reading like different versions of the Bible to like compare and contrast what they would say and how they'd be similar and how they'd be different and like what was missing from them. And I was looking at it from that perspective. But I, I think that, um, 
But that was really the only thing I ever did. I never went to church or anything. I never studied it. Um, like I never went to Bible study. I mean, maybe like one or two things here or there just to like mess around. But um, mm. my my interest in it was like, like what is the historical truth in this thing? And so I was reading a lot of stuff um, about that. But that was a long time ago. I don't really remember much of it anymore. Um, but well, the like, reason my I thing with Adam. I, I wonder how ahead. impactful it'll be or how significant it, it'll seem to you or what your impression will be. If you're a person who doesn't already have a lot of Bible knowledge, because it's pretty, it sort of presupposes you know a lot of things in this book. So, but but maybe you'll still get it. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I have to. I have to see. But like, I think with 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 what you're talking about, though, this is kind of what I was alluding to on the last stream I did with Adam, where we were talking, like he was just like laying out like all the things for me, and I was just looking at it and going, "You could read this in a completely different way." if you have the frame of reference that it's like, that this is like the way the truth, the light and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you can read it in a completely different way from that perspective. But like, once you have the framing of, you know, this contradicts whether or not this is a historical person, you start seeing these uh, passages from just a completely different perspective. And it's like what you said, when you were, you know, in Bible college, like you saw it from the one perspective and it sounds like, you didn't you it didn't even cross your mind to kind of like question that at the time and so there would be no possibility that you could even see that that passage and think this is proof that Jesus never existed yeah it's that uh makes sense. it's it's to me it's um like a huge one is to, to realize that there's no actual evidence that Jesus existed right that's huge that's huge but also for me, it's like, okay, well, it's hard to imagine, well, then why did they just invent this guy? And how could they have done that? And and the story that I always heard was that it caught on like wildfire. And like part of the reason for believing is the fact that, well, there were so many believers and there were so many eyewitnesses and there's so much credible evidence. And the church like really took off after Jesus like inaugurated it. And none of that's even true either. There aren't any eyewitnesses. There's no uh, textual proof. And in fact, the text that we have is highly dubious. And um, anybody who should have known him didn't. And the, historical, the, the historians who are writing the antiquities in here, they never mentioned him. And the one dubious mention that was there appears to have been a forgery. And all of these events that are said to have happened didn't happen in the Bible. Um, this sea that is said to have existed wasn't a sea. This route that they traveled wasn't even the right route. And why was that? It's because somebody from outside the territory wrote it. Somebody from a whole other region was sort of like, basically like a fictional journey that Jesus went on. It's like there's so much stuff that's just like, what what's going on here? And then, then there's this part where it's, you can see where they actually formed it you know, the, the Gnostics were doing weird things and there were certain sorts of like cosmic messiah cults that were being formed and there were uh, these proto-Kabbalistic aspects and there were astrological aspects that created these needs for like a 12 mythical tribes and 12 disciples aligning with the 12 signs of the Zodiac and and there's all these different motifs and this even the concept of the Lord's Supper like that's not even a Christian concept that like the Zoroastrians or whatever, they had a Lord's supper and it was almost the same thing. And it had to do with the 12 sitting around around a meal that had to do with bread and wine. And it's like, Whoa, wait a minute. That's all taken from something else. And the first mention of it didn't even call it the last supper. It was called the Lord's supper. And then later on the reiteration of that tale called it the last supper. And then they say that it was a Passover meal, but the first mention of it says that it was the night before Passover. So it wasn't a Passover, like a lot of things. And these are not small technicalities. Like if it, it's just like, you can see even the story itself within the Bible. It's many different books because the Bible isn't a book. It's like a library. It's like 66 books. No, no, it's 70 books by 60 authors or something crazy. It's, they call it the book, but it's a whole bunch of books, a bunch of small books. And each one sort of is built on the other one. And you can see how it morphs and see how it's written to different audiences and see how it, it's missing details that if it was this author, they should have known this and they didn't. So we know it wasn't that author. And so it's, it's 
They're all from unknown sources. And then it got it all cobbled together into this big, like, powerful story that's been used on us for so long. And in such a powerful way that now even questioning it is, well, for many ages, they would kill you for that. But even now, I mean, I have people in my audience who've done actual damage to me, like, taken some of my audience away, encouraged people who supported the stream to stop. They've gone around and slandered me and tried to chase me out of certain communities and stuff because I talked about Jesus, because I had these types of conversations. Like, they've harassed me and, like, literally tried to come and fuck me up. So they're they're maniacs, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Oh, I believe it. Yeah. It's wild, man. It's like there's there's it's like such a vicious cult and it's endured for so long and it's all something it's all just like made up by these ancient Jews. And even the ones who say like, "Oh, you're interpreting it wrong. It shouldn't be interpreted by you. It has to be interpreted the way the original authors intended it." Oh, you mean the original Jews? <laughs> like you you're literally right. saying you have to interpret it the way the ancient Jews meant it. When you, <laughs> it's like Hello, it's so crazy. Anyway, I mean, Christians get crazy when you go against them. They get, they get, they yeah. get insane. Not all of them, but like a lot of them really lose it. And you think you're talking to these normal people, and then like I've had this happen to me. Like when I was, um, like, I mean, like the reason I I got into trouble with that whole like Hitler went to heaven tweet is I had literally made the decision. That I was like, I'm going to talk about my spiritual beliefs just like Christians talk about their spiritual beliefs to me. And like, we're going to see how they like it. And I'm not going to apologize. And I'm just going to get in their face and I'm going to evangelize to them. And we're going to see how they like being like, you know, like preached to all the time for a belief system that they don't want. And that didn't work out so well for me because the Christians got really effing pissed off. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it. Yeah, they'll, they'll say to you, you're going to burn in hell. If you don't accept Jesus and you're like, oh, okay, well, Jesus isn't real. And they're like, hey, right. fucking shut the fuck up. That's offensive. It's like, what? you just yeah. told me that I'm going to burn in hell. Fuck you. You're offensive. You're telling me if I don't believe in this Jewish story, I'm going to burn in hell. And you're telling me, but I'm offending you when I say Jesus was made up by Jews and I don't believe it. Like, they're like, yes. And if you offend me, I have the right to like, hurt you. Oh, God. So, yeah, they want the world so, to be like a safe space for Christians. I have a question, though. Like, so so you you literally went to Bible college. Like, what made you start questioning, like, is any of this true? And, like, how did that feel when you kind of, like, started changing your mind about that? Yeah, it happened during that time. Um, well, when I graduated uh, from high school, I was on the track to go work for the fire department and I still wanted to get a bachelor's degree. So I was going to school at night. And uh, so I was like in a, you know, I, I, was, I did it that way. I didn't just like go off to college and live oh, there and stuff. Okay. So I was working okay. my way through college and I didn't, you know, that was my plan. I was just going to work for the fire department anyway, but you get to be paid more and advance faster when you have a degree. So I was going to chip away at it while I was working. And there was a night program that I could go to. It was like a, you know, a, uh, correspondence courses and things like that. And also I had already finished a lot before I graduated high school. I already basically had the AA done through the local community college. Cause I found out that if you go to the community college, community college, not only do they pay for it, if you're still in high school, it's free, but also it counts for college credits and high school credits. So I graduated high school early with already my first year and a half of college done through the local college which ruled. So I just transferred those over and I was going to finish up at night at the, at the university I went to, I got a, like a grant to go there. Yada, yada. All right, anyway, so it was a Christian university I went to. After I did a, a semester at a local Bible college because I had some friends that went there, and uh, I, I dabbled with the idea of actually going and receiving a certification, which it was not exactly seminary, but it's like kind of the uh, Pro Protestant equivalent of going to, it's like a pastor's college. And I only went for one semester and I dipped. But um, because I was too busy with the other thing and it wasn't my priority, and I knew I didn't fit in there. Everybody was kind of too fruity or whatever. It wasn't for me. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, I did go to a Christian university for this program at night to go get my bachelor's degree. And part of the onboarding at that Christian university, you had to go to a overview of the Bible course to, as a prereq. And I had already done a ton of Bible study and I'd done a semester at that Bible college and I was raised in it and everything. 
but I was, uh, where was I? I was like 18 or 19, right? I had just finished high school. I went through fire academy. I'm working on the ambulance. I'm volunteering at the fire department. I'm going to school at night. And also I should include that in this time, like I just said a little while ago, I was on a stream with Adam Green and Adam King. I don't know if you saw that. I just did a stream with them. But we mentioned The Matrix had a huge impact on me, that movie. The Matrix, along with, because that came out in the summer of 99. And I was, a uh, maybe that was the summer before my junior year, I think. So between sophomore and junior year, The Matrix came out. I went into that movie not even knowing what it was. I hadn't seen a trailer. My friend said he was going to the movie. You want to go? Sure. Um, we went and saw the movie. I walked out of that theater and I was like, what the fuck? Like I, I saw the world different. It was really mind blowing. It was like a first, it was a real philosophical mind bender. And I considered some things like, how do I know that I know anything is true? It was the first time I really started asking that to myself. How do I fucking know that I know anything? Which is sort of like a deep philosophical question about like the ontological truth of anything or whatever. Um, how do I know that I know what I know? What if I'm fucking wrong? What if I'm just convinced of things that are untrue? Which is sort of like the premise of the matrix that the, the world is pulled over your eyes. It's a bunch of lies. Nothing's what you think it is. There's actually just a big scam going on. And that sort of like primed me, right? To be thinking a little deeper as a young man, as a teenager. Whatever. And, and I was in a very rigid worldview of christianity right i knew what was true to me was revealed by god in the bible you know so that's what i was told and i took it for granted because all the adults who i knew and loved and respected they all believed it too so i just you know as a child i was like yeah they they know what's true and i'm just lucky enough to have been i heard the truth these poor bastards out there who don't know about jesus they just don't know and Satan is keeping them from knowing the truth of God's love. <laughs> you know, it was just like so pure and obvious and whatever. And I didn't really, like, why question it? You know, my mom and dad and my pastor and all my friends, everybody believes in it. So I th thought it was just true. Like, duh. Yeah. Jesus is real. Died for our sins. I'm going to heaven. Angels are nice. Santa Claus, the whole thing. And... And there's a devil, and that's why people do bad things, because Satan makes people wicked. And it's like, oh, why would anybody do something horrible to somebody else? Oh, the devil. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, it was that black and white. Anyway, now I'm like a young man. I saw The Matrix. I kind of blew my mind a little bit. And then two years later, right after I graduate, the September after I finish high school, 9-11 happens, 2001. And... That was the first time it, that occurred to me, holy shit, it's because they told me that it was Muslim zealots, Muslim extremists, who oh. had uh, given their lives for their faith. Right? That's what that was, the terror attack. That, they, I heard this tales about, like, they believe they're getting 72 virgins in the afterlife. They died for Allah because they are Mohammedans, they're Islamists or whatever. And I had heard of Islam, and I knew there were other religions, but that's all of a sudden it was close to home. And I was like, whoa, those guys, this is because what they told us is those guys are so committed and convinced of their faith that they gave their lives for it. Like, and I just watched it happen. They, they killed themselves for their faith. Like they really believed that their after, afterlife story or their version of God was real, so real that they gave their lives for it. And now there's all this talk about what's going on in the Middle East and these uh, Islam and that impact impacted me. I was like, well, how do I know that my faith doesn't prove that I'm right? Because they have at least as much faith as me, maybe more than me, you know? And that made me really think like, well, mm -hmm. just because I believe strongly in my thing, does that mean I'm right? Because I think that they're wrong. So they were a, a clear example of somebody who could believe with all of their heart and be totally wrong. And I looked in the mirror and I thought, well, well, what if that's me? And that was a big mind mm. expander, you know? So I was primed by the Matrix to think that, uh, well, how do I know that I know anything? And then I saw 9-11 happen. I'm like, well, they're wrong, but they thought they were right. What if that's me? And it all then the the third... 
um, leg to come out from under the stool or whatever was I started working on the ambulance and I had a partner and my partner wasn't a Christian. So I had left my, my Christian echo chamber, my Christian bubble where my friends and family, everybody I knew and respected, we were basically all Christians. I had some non-Christian friends, but they weren't like grown up. They didn't know the world yet, but I had a partner who was like a couple years older than me. So I'm like 19, maybe he's like 23 or 25. He might've been 25 and he's like married. And he was like, no, Christianity's fucking bullshit, dude. It's fake. What? It's the first time I ever encountered like a secular person who was just sure that that was all bullshit. And, he, and I spent time with him. I'm working 24 hour shifts. So we have a lot of time to chat. And he starts bringing me books. He's like, yeah, you need to read this book, dude. It's going to blow your mind. He gave me a Richard Dawkins book and a Sam Harris book and a couple other ones. I don't know if you've read any of their work, but he gave me Letter to a Christian Nation and um, The Selfish Gene by Richard, Richard Dawkins. Something else about evolution. And I was told in church that evolution was just a hoax and a scam made up by Satan to convince us away from Christianity and creationism. I had never, I, I was interested in it. I had learned in science class and stuff, but there was a, still like a filter around me that was telling me to reject it. Even though I understood the theory and how it all supposed to work and everything, but I was like, nah, nah, we were probably created in the garden and whatever. But, wow. but let's say, so as a young man at 19, I'm like, all right, there's a lot of shit that I'm reading now that is like, I don't know how to overcome this. There's questions posed to me in this book that I don't have the answer to. And I'm trained to know this stuff. Like I used to go on missionary trips with the high school groups to go evangelize. And I was trained to have answers and I had answers good enough for basic stuff. But in these books, it was hitting me with like gut punches. I'm like, I don't know the answer to this one. Fuck. So I brought those questions to my professor at this intro to the Bible class at the university. And he was a good person to bring it to because he was outside of my local church group and outside of my pastoral training group that I was in. And he was a university level Bible professor. And this guy knew Greek and Hebrew and he knew church history. And he, he was an old man who fucking knew everything. He was training at the university. So I started bringing him every night into this intro to the Bible class that most people were in there. They were kind of phoning it in, you know, it was a, it was a prerequisite. Everybody at this university has to take it and you just have to pass this course to get by and get your credits. You can go on to everything else at school. Some people were interested in you know, learning, but I was there to do battle every night. I was showing up with <laughs> a fucking, a bunch of notes and questions and I was going to get answers from this guy and I was grilling him. And he was giving me a lot of time because he liked it. He's like, this is great. We're exploring all of this stuff. We're getting into a lot of really good subjects. We can bring it back to the, the work that I, the assignment I just gave you last week. And I would always try to like make it related to the assignment we just had. And I was really digging in on him. And what I found in that whole semester I spent in there with him, I would press and press and press on this question, that question, that question. And every single time, if I drilled far enough, I got the exact same answer from him and it sucked and the answer was well mike that's where it comes down to faith uh -huh. like every fucking time i would press 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 and he would go well faith and that was the end of it every time we'd hit the bottom and he was just like well that's where it comes down to faith either you believe or you don't and I was like, that sucks, dude. So literally, I mean, but the fucking terrorists have faith. How do, you, how do you know you're right? And you can't even answer these questions. It seems like you should be able to answer this if it's obviously true. And he's like, well, God works in mysterious ways. And sometimes he doesn't give us all the answers because he wants to fill it. wants us to have a trusting heart that trusts him. And that's part of our act of love toward God is to yield toward him in trust. And I was like. This is a fucking wow. scam, dude. This is fucking crazy. You're gaslighting me so hard. Fuck you. And I got mad. I literally was just like, dude, if this guy doesn't know the answers to this questions, then nobody does. This is bullshit. And um, how am I destroying this guy as a know nothing like a teenager? And I was. And I and that's when I knew, like, I think I just got 
I got scammed and I, and then I got mad. I was like, dude, my, I fucking, I did not, my high school sweetheart who I fucking loved and she was so fine and I never fucked her for Jesus. And I was pissed. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh my God. I can't believe I got so scammed at a pussy. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, it got personal. And so, but fortunately I still had a really I had a new girlfriend and she was really hot too. And I did. And then I did go fuck her and I was having sex and I was like living in sin. And then I smoked weed for the first time. And I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, my high school sweetheart, dude, I never, never even got past second base because I was saving it for marriage for Jesus and stuff. And she went on to go become a Christian evangelist and she, and she, we, she married a brown guy and got fat. It's a tragedy, but probably um, for the best. Probably for the best. Yeah, she, it would have been a nightmare. But I <laughs> could have had her <laughs> when we were both young. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been so cool. <laughs> anyway, um, oh well, say la vie. But yeah, I got personal. But so that's kind of what happened, you know. I just went through that phase from the time of uh, like nineteen to twenty one. Um, I really went through a crisis and I didn't really know for sure, but all I knew, I didn't become like a super atheist, but I became like, I was sure that nobody knew what the fuck was going on and they were full of shit. I just, that's when I just realized everybody's full of shit. Yeah, I just realized real. everybody's fucking full of shit and nobody knows what's going on and they're all lying and they don't mind lying and they just fill in their at their gaps of knowledge with fucking bullshit. They just fill it in and they act like it's real. And that's what made me kind of into, um, anyway, it took me down a lot of places, but I, I just realized like nobody knows what's going on. They're all fucking scamming. Were you mad at your parents for like raising you in it? Because honestly, like my parents fucked up a lot in the raising of me and my brother. But like the one thing they did correctly, and I, I'll stand by this, is they did not try to force their religious views on us at all. They were literally like, we want you guys to explore the world and make up your own minds. And that was probably the smartest thing my parents ever did. Well, for me, my parents didn't really push it on me. I mean, they did bring me to church and they were very, you know, in it. And they're like just true believers, you know. And we would pause and pray at dinner and we would go to church on Sunday. And they were very like living for eternity kind of Christians, you know, and thankful to Jesus and praying for the lost souls of sinners. And like they just like are trying to be sweet people. And so they, I was surrounded by a lot of those. And so, but it, my experience was that it was actually just very, mostly especially from my perspective at the time which was childish and naive i didn't there's a lot of stuff going on looking back that i just didn't see i just only saw the good side of it when i was a kid it was just felt very wholesome and warm and nice you know and it was people getting together and singing like what's fucking more lit than that people just getting together and singing a song that was church to me. That's where people get together and they sing songs together. And that's fucking awesome. By the way, when people just raise up their voices and they sing the same song, it's like magic. It's amazing when people sing together and like, where else do people do that? They do it at church. They just get together and they're singing songs about like love. It's incredible. So that's like a very amazing thing to me. And, um, so I thought that was badass and people were kind and there was like coffee and donuts and the kids were happy and giggling and playing. And there was always like a, like, you know, a playground and like, it was just for families to come together and ha enjoy a nice time. Everybody would dress up and treat each other with courtesy. And like, that was every week for me, there was one day a week where we went to this place where everybody was sweet and they gave each other hugs and they were dressed up nice and all the mommies like had on perfume and they smelled good and it was just badass. Like I loved it. I loved church. That was my experience. So by the time I became like a young teenager, I still went to like, I enjoyed, then they had like the young, the youth group, 
meeting you can go to on Wednesdays and all your buddies were there and there's a fucking foosball table and there's a rock and roll band. And then we would do a fundraiser and go to laser tag or go to on a trip to the beach. And it was the shit. And there was always like a pizza party and it was dope. And, and every, and it was like, everybody was just like being cool. And also the girls were hot. And they all were very flirty. And there was always like a circle of girls that were talking to each other. And they would love it when I would come over and chat with them. And, and it, I loved it. It was just awesome. And so I sort of, they, my parents didn't really push it on me. I just ate it up. I just ate it up. It was just the best. It was just a bunch of white people hanging out, having a good time, singing, giving hugs, coffee and donuts, pizza party, beach trip, laser tag, hot girls. Like, what's not to love? Like, only fucking losers didn't go to church. That was my opinion. Like, oh, what are you, some kind of fucking loser? Yo, are you going to go to, like, watch <laughs> Beavis and Butthead and do drugs, you fucking fag? Go to church. Look, it was bitching. That's how I felt, personally. I just really liked it. So, hmm. so yeah, when and then, you know, uh, you would sit through all these sermons and stuff, but it was also, that was fascinating to me. Like, I like learning. A lot. So when somebody would come and they would do like a deep dive into the like the interesting fucking correlation between Psalms and Proverbs, or they would go into like the exile of the Jews into the Babylon, or they would do a you know a relating the different you know like you said the symbolism and this and that, I was like, whoa, <laughs> it was tripping me out. Or they would somebody they would somebody would come in and give a testimony about how like Jesus changed their life and they used to be on drugs and and they were alcoholic and they were living under a bridge and their life was falling apart. And then they found Jesus and now everything's better and they own a business and they got a family and everything's cool. And I was like, wow. It's like amazing. It was always cool. It was I mean that's how that's what my experience was like. It was just I was just like in a cool club that was just nice. And my grandma went to church three times a week and I fucking loved my grandma. My grandma was awesome. And she was just like the sweetest, like an angel. She was like a saint, like the best person in the world. And she loved Jesus. And I was just like, fucking, okay, me too then. Like Jesus is cool. She's cool with my grandma. It's cool with me. My grandma is so fucking rad. But that, so my parents didn't push it on me, but they did shield me from a lot of the worldly things too, though. Like there were certain TV programs that were just like, no, we don't, we don't watch that certain movies. We don't watch certain type of music. We don't watch that. We were just very, we'll just find something more wholesome, something more Christian. So I was a little bit shielded from the world, which I think was probably good in a lot of ways. And, um, it did feel a little cramped. Sometimes there was things I wanted to do that I wasn't allowed to. And I didn't, you know, Oh man. But looking back, probably preserved and protected me a bit. There's a lot of traumatizing things in the world that I was kept from, which is nice. Mm. So I don't, I didn't, I didn't really have hard feelings for them. If there was any like actual resentment though, like, look, I won't, I don't want to say a lot about this, but there's a gap between me and my parents, specifically my dad that I hate. And it mm. exists because of Jesus. Because when I started questioning, my dad took it hard. Because my dad is like yeah. a fucking true believer. It's part of his personality. He's living for the afterlife. And also seeing me lose the faith is really hard for him. And he, like to a believer like my dad, he thinks that Satan came into my life and stole his son. That's what my dad's experience is. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to my dad, ever since then, I don't think he even really sees me. That's how it feels on my end. He see, I see him looking at me through the eyes of a person who thinks I'm possessed. He's looking at me with like, not shame or anger, but like sadness and worry. Like he doesn't even see me. He, and he doesn't, when he hears what I say to him, he doesn't take it seriously. He's trying to filter through the lies of the devil and save me from the trap. It's crazy. So I kind of lost my dad. It fucking blows. I can understand that. I I haven't talked to my father in um, over ten years. Last and it, it was ten years in April. Um, the last time I talked to my father, and so I I understand that different different circumstances. Not because uh you know I did left the church or anything, but it my does dad's not perfect. But he was a fucking cool guy. Yeah, he was like a cool motherfucker, and 
um, when I started asking questions as a young man, he did not take it seriously. He like tried to encourage me not to ask those questions. He didn't have good answers. I lost some respect for him too because it happened on both sides. I started also having less respect for my dad because I saw him as someone who's caught up in the brainwashing. Like, oh, you're fuck. My dad, who used to be like a superhero, now I see him as a guy who's duped. Like he's a sheep. Isn't that isn't that rough. funny when you start to see your parents differently like that? Mm-hmm. And I kind of wonder if everyone goes through that to a certain extent where like, you know, I remember being younger and seeing my parents like at my yeah. age now and like feeling like my parents knew everything and they had it all together. And then you kind of reach this age and you're like, my parents didn't actually have it together. Like I, that was just that that was wrong. That was not mm-hmm. correct at all. And so I think that's kind of like a mind fuck that everyone goes through at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So that was pretty wild. And, um, so There's that might, that, that might be a little bit of, okay. Oh, if anybody wanted to psychologize me, why is big tech so fucking crazy about this one issue? Why is he, why doesn't he like, <laughs> why does he just move on? Why don't you let Jesus, who cares? I always try to debunk Jesus and stuff. He stole my fucking dad. Okay. Jesus stole my dad. Jesus like oh. my, it's personal. He fucked up my relationship with my father. Like that's so fuck you. If you don't want me to talk about Jesus, well, he stole my fucking dad. I'm going to talk about it. It's personal. That's deep. Yeah. I mean, I wonder there, there's something to the idea though, that like, you know, as, and I saw someone in your chat say this earlier, and I'm not like really responding to them, but it's kind of like on the topic of like, um, you know, like people say like, you know, Carlin's a grifter. She does all like she's changed her mind. She's trying to be in all these groups or something. But I think there's something to like the idea that once you see through one layer of bullshit, it becomes a lot easier to kind of like understand layers of bullshit in other areas when you see them. Right. So it's like, yeah, I saw through the bullshit on the left and then I was able to see through the bullshit on the right significantly quicker than I was able to see through the bullshit on the left because, you know, I just wasn't I wasn't paying attention for a long time. It took me 20 years to see through the bullshit on the left. And then once I saw that, I was like, once I saw the same stuff starting to happen on the right, like back in like, you know, right after Biden took office, it was very easy for me to see through that bullshit. And then like you just kind of keep digging and digging and digging. And I think it becomes, at least for me, Maybe I'm an anomaly. I don't know. But it, like, it became much easier for me to kind of keep taking like red pill after red pill because once you learn to see through it for one thing, you can see through it for like other things too. I don't I even know. See people I was just thinking in, about that because like. Yeah, it is how it is how it works. Once you once you get one, you go, oh, I get it. It's it's almost like it's the same. It's, re, it's the same thing happening in different ways. Mm-hmm. They're saying in chat, uh, forgive Jesus. It, okay. The way I said it is obviously hyperbolic. The real thing that happened is that Jews invented a mind virus that my dad got infected with, and it ruined my relationship with my dad. A fucking Jewish mind virus got into my dad. So why why was Big Tech so angry at the Jews? Well, they fucking invented a mind virus and infected my dad with it. That's how. That's what it really is. Not the not the Jews of today, okay, but but this it's a fucking scam that my family got caught up in, and it wasn't all good. Okay. Came at a cost. I don't like it. You know, I have a I have a person in my community. She runs my movie nights, and um, she uh she grew up in a Christian cult, and like of it, like and it was like 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 you know they weren't allowed to talk to anyone outside the cult. They had to give all their money to like the head of the cult and all this stuff. And it was like a relatively famous Christian cult. I just can't remember the name of it, um, off the top of my head. But um, but she and her parents eventually like left the cult, and like her parents carry so much guilt for like you know like and I, I like I met them when I was out in Colorado and we had a conversation about this. Like her parents carry so much guilt for the fact that like. They had they're still Christians, but they they introduced their daughter to this cult and this fucked up her life and this limited her opportunities and all that. And it's kind of like, you know, the way that my my community member sees it is that she wouldn't be able to, like, do the things today if she hadn't gone through that. You know what I'm saying? And like that kind of like led her to be the person she is. And it led her to like. You know, she she'll talk a lot about like, you know, like, you know, forgiving and like, you know, letting not carrying around anger towards like how that happened. But, you know, I guess kind of like, you know, just kind of like seeing it as a part of the journey or whatever. And I think it's like, I I don't know. I think it's 
it's it's got to be hard for your dad and i bet it's kind of the same for you where it's kind of like a death to a certain extent it's like yeah. you have this person that you thought you knew and you thought you understood them and that person is no longer there and so actually it's even worse than a death because like even like with a death like that the memory of that person is still there right that person is still that person but it's kind of like when people right. change like that it's almost like that person never existed yeah, my dad's in a prison. So when I talk to him, he's on the other yeah. side of glass. I can't. I don't actually have access to him as a person because he sees me as a compromised, fallen, fallen to the lie of the devil. He, to, I'm talking to a guy who, to him, I'm dead. Like I am, I am in hell, and I'm stolen away from the truth. And say, I let Satan in my life, and I fell to the de- like. And he wasn't able to save me, and he just sees me with sadness. He doesn't see me. Like, I can't really, like, relate to my dad. There's a, there's a distance, and it's there because of his perspective of the world that I left. I, I, we shared it, and then I departed from it, and he wasn't able to go with me. So, so I'm, and, and he, and there's a wall between us where he won't really know me. So he's still alive, but it's, but not, but, but the, but the connection we had is forever. There's a gap. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. So he doesn't trust me. He doesn't, uh, he's sort of not interested. He thinks the things that I'm interested in are just evil and wicked. Um, he's judgmental. Uh, it, it manifests in all those different ways where it's like, oh, I can't even like really connect to my dad so he's still alive i'm just waiting for him to die but but our but our relationship in a way died because of the jewish mind virus <laughs> whoa so now you're gonna red pull the world yeah the so dad. yeah so uh, yeah i got my little personal vendetta there I mean, <laughs> I mean, it is kind of funny though how like all your life circumstances really seem to put you in a position to be able to be a really good person to do this. Like, if you hadn't gone to Bible college, if you hadn't known the Bible inside and out, if you hadn't been raised in these communities, would you even be in a position to be able to, you know, do this with people? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and when I when I try to drop it, when I try to just leave it alone. It keeps calling me back, so I don't know. It, it does seem that life yeah. sort of shaped me to, like, that's uh, whatever. If it's a calling or if it's a, well, that's my personal crusade. It's funny to call it a crusade, but it's like an anti-crusade. And so, yeah, the, pe- <laughs> the, the people who attack me, the, these Christians who, like, have kind of come after me and tried to do stuff to me, some of them literally call me the Antichrist. And that's what I'm really kind of being sort of my thing you should make that a t-shirt out of that yeah big antichrist why not <laughs> which is goofy because it's still it's sort of like uh playing into their it's still in their frame but that's how they see it in their frame oh you literally are of the spirit of the abomination of desolation and you are succumb to the dark lord satan it's like oh god dude I don't really want to give it credence and play into it. It's so goofy. But well, that's what exactly gives Satanists like their power anyway, too. It's like, oh, if you create a world where there's a bad guy villain who's super powerful, oh, well, then if you call yourself a Satanist, you kind of get all that power. So they've created a power. Mm-hmm. That's why Crowley and that's why, uh, you know, all these people, that's why they're Satanists. They don't even believe in Satan, but they understand, oh, in this world, Satan is an archetype in our minds. If you play off of that, you can play off people's fear and people's uh, the the suppressed desires that they've been suppressing because of this Jesus concept, and you can feed in. There's like a there's a pressure that you can become the release valve for, and uh, you can kind of tax all that energy that comes out of it and just play off of it. And then you, that's what the devil card means in the tarot. Oh yeah, it's about basically being like oppressed by like your own desires. Um, it can mean a lot of other things too, but like in the in the the traditional tarot deck, just like the Rider Weight deck, um, if you look at it, like the 
the devil card is basically like, you know, this, you know, it's a Capricorn. It's like a goat, but it also has like two naked people, a man and a woman, and they both have chains around their neck that they're chained to like the altar. But if you look at the chains, they're loose enough where if they wanted to just take the chains off and step out of them, they could. So they're literally kind of like trapped there due to their own their own desire to be trapped there. So there's like something about wanting to be oppressed and wanting to have like this burden on you that you could easily remove if you just decided to do it. Right. Yep. That's kind of how it is. It's like, um, there's a weird, there's a weird pressure that, and those, the, the, uh, the occultists, um, the Freemasons, the, um, the magicians, they understand this. So they, they get that, oh, you can set up a dialectic like that where if you get people to think a certain thing is evil and you, ca- you cause them to repress it in themselves and then you become the only person that gives them access to that thing that they're denying, now you own, you have so much power. Like we were just talking with Adam about, you know, people, you give them an outlet, then it's through some sort of sexual vice or through gambling or through drugs or something like that. Now they're fiending for an outlet because you've created this big old pressure in them. And then if you're the one who Aww. controls that vice industry, now you're a billionaire. Now you are a gangster. Yep. And we call in it's weird, but that's why they're always involved in that kind of stuff. Yep. And they that's why sides. Christian sexual repression is so stupid because it just creates repressed human beings. So yeah, you should have just fucked your high school girlfriend. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that, that's like one of the stupidest things that Christians do is sexual repression. It's like, you're just asking honestly for like all sorts of problems because it's not just about having sex, getting laid, like whatever. It's not just about that. It's about like, you are repressing certain energy in yourself that we as human beings are designed to experience. And You know, Nick is not off base when he says that if you're not having sex, you can channel that energy into other things like sexual energy is just creative energy. And so like you like it's the ultimate creative energy because it can create life. So if you channeling that into like creative pursuits, that can help. But ultimately, like you're still sexually repressed and that's still going to manifest itself in some really weird ways. And I, I really think that that's like one of Nick's probably biggest problems is that he is a virgin. He is sexually repressing himself. Like, I don't care if he's gay or not. And that is manifesting in some really weird ways. Yeah, it does. (laughs) It does. Go get laid. Just go get laid. It's okay. Everyone will be fine. (laughs) It is true. People have, uh, men have written about it for a long time that, um, if you, to be like really successful and powerful, it does take um, a, a very a highly sexed person, and the, not meaning somebody who's like getting laid a lot, but somebody who's it's a, it's sexual cre- creative energy is the same as the energy that drives us to go want to breed. It's like the um, the seeking. It's like a hor- if you're horny for life, if you're horny for your project, if like. If you find gratification in making progress toward your destination or your dream or your your purpose or your endeavor, that's what it means to really like channel genius in a way. And most of the geniuses of our time were they were very uh, highly sexual people, but rather than going just chasing pussy, they were chasing uh, an outcome of another type. But it's a channeling of that same of the vril virility exactly yeah exactly yeah but in christianity we were, but that's the, the weird thing is when you get told that that's sin it's like that feeling or that energy that's satan you have to pray for it to go away you have to like uh, suppress it you have to like shame this is the shame and guilt and all sorts of stuff um around it rather than a, a teaching like a wise way to harness it Harness it and use it for something good. There's nothing shameful about it. It's natural. and In fact, it's like a tremendous power uh, in your life. Like, no, it's wicked. It's fallen. It's carnal. It's lustful. Like, rather than teaching uh, and having a way to sh- create a lust for life, a life-affirming philosophy, it was really just you have to overcome and cut that off and be chaste. And try to just be 
like cultivate meekness and patience and all of this other thing. The way it was delivered to me anyway was didn't work out. And most people in the youth group were fucking too. That was the crazy thing, but they were just feeling guilty about it or they were just doing it a little bit mm. or they were getting caught and there was a scandal or something, you know, or, or eventually they would grow up and then they would become twisted. You know, they would end up spinning off to become like, become goth or punk or they would get into drugs or they would do something it would it would be pent up and then when eventually when the dam burst it would burst into some sort of like spastic direction it's a lot of really or they would just get married young and then they would get divorced later or they would uh you know just kind of be miserable or they would get into just sort of like a, a cringe sort of dull life i saw a lot of people go that way it was weird tragedies I mean, like, I think, like, society would be so much better off if people just, like, normalized their, their like, you know, relationship with sex. Because it really seems like most people are just, like, an extreme on either side. Either they're completely sexually repressing themselves, which is going to lead to really weird things. Or they're just completely, like, oversexed and they're porn addicted and, like, stuff like that. And that's also going to lead to really weird and, like, toxic things because that's not good either. And it's like, I don't know what's so difficult about just, like being normal about sex is like it's part of life we all do this this is like natural this is not something to be ashamed of like you know but also be smart about it like don't don't just run right out and fuck any everyone because you know you're going to take on the energy of who you fuck and that's not going to be a good thing for you either or you might get pregnant and you might not want that or like whatever like why can't there just be a balance of like this is not something to feel shame over and but just be smart about it i don't get it it's going to be a weird world when the dam breaks completely. I mean, we're already feeling it and you know, there's Insta hoes and, and only fans and all that, uh, you know, internet dating culture. And we went through like the free love thing in the sixties. There was a kind of like a bursting out moment there, but man, when it like really breaks the, the one, the other thing that we don't have, it's like, we have like a total repression on violence too. There's like no violence mm -hmm. allowed. Nobody's allowed to get in a fight. Nobody's allowed to kill. Um, that's another thing that we're totally repressed on. We don't. We have like a total monopoly on violence, and it's a hands-off society. And any and violence is always bad. In the same way that like sex is always bad in Christianity, like our culture is still that violence is always bad unless it's like sanctioned for a spectacle you're a UFC fighter or something. That's the only time. Or if you have a uniform badge and even then you're supposed to show all this restraint you can. And, um, but, um, if there was some sort of liberation on sex and violence, I think people would just be, we would be different creatures. If we lived in a world where you had to watch how you behave, otherwise somebody might fucking kill you. We would behave different and you had to watch the choices you make. Be, um, and you want to, you're making choices, based on the fact that everybody is a viable sexual partner and so much uh, prudentry, or I don't know if that's a right word, right word. I think about it sometimes, like, what what is the world going to be like when the, like, in the AI future, like we were talking about earlier with Adam, for those who were here for that part of the stream, I think it's going to remake society so drastically. One of the dangerous traps we might fall in is that we might actually fall into a weird like orgy fuck fest future which would be really kind of wild and ecstatic but also it would be we we could go off the cliff where we just it just becomes like porn world like full-blown just everything is about sex we might the pendulum might swing way past where it is right now where we, we all just become actual, just like it just might become a sex economy. Like what? Like it literally could. I've been, I don't want to get totally into explaining how it could be that, but um, when the, when the brakes come off and we all get this, these weird medical technologies where everybody's just like totally beautiful and total, and we all live forever and, Everything's taken care of and nobody has to fight or hunt for anything. We don't have to build anything. We have nothing but free time. What would the economy be? And it will basically become an economy of exchange between partners. And we could 
we might become like hypersexual. And um, and also when breeding and recreation get gets taken off, where we're like no longer even having natural births anymore, like we might be cloning ourselves or growing our babies in birthing pods or who knows what CRISPR gene editing babies. This is what I mean. Like in a future where we started editing our genes to where we're all totally immaculate and beautiful and we have no jobs because they're not needed because robots do everything for us. What would we do with our time? And it you might just be early just describe brave new world. Yeah, I know. It's brave new world. Exactly. That's what you're describing. It's yeah. Fordism. Right. <laughs> Yeah, orgy porgy. And that's what it is. And everybody's on some sort of drug that makes them feel good. Everybody's beautiful. And it's just like, who are you fucking this week? Oh, I was thinking about fucking this person. Oh, yeah. cool. And then are you going to, and then everyone that's, belongs to everyone else. Everybody belongs to everybody. And nobody's babies belong to anybody because you don't even know where they come from. Because it's just like a semen collection agency. And, uh, and everybody's just like, it's like eternal sex summer camp planet. <laughs> like, Weird, but but that would also like bring everything to a halt in a way. There's no more innovation. There's no need to explore. There's no need, no need to build. We made it. You know, this is it. And now it's just everybody having sex forever, like Goon World. Well, but even but even in that world, there were people that didn't fit in, but they just got sent off to like an island somewhere where they couldn't right. be around like all the people who just wanted to fuck all day. Yeah. But they they st did still exist. Yeah, but that's kind of like what made the story happen, right? Is that that happened? But in reality, would would that be a thing? Would there be that island? Uh, would well, there be any natives yeah, there was, who were outside? So there was. So there there was the guy that came from the reservation into the, like the the you know the the brave new world or whatever. But there was also the guy. There was a guy that was already there. Um, that was just kind of like, you know, like a, you know, a beta level worker or whatever. And he was just like, he was really into poetry and he loved poetry and that was just his thing. And so when, um, when the main character got sent off to the island to read uh, Shakespeare or whatever, the mm -hmm. other guy decided to go too, because he didn't want to live in this world. And he was, you know, completely raised in that environment. So you know, like yeah. there might always be anomalies to the rule. I mean, there's, there's, there has to be like, there has to be some sort of like, not everyone can just like we there, i i i don't want to imagine a reality in which the only thing that we do is like we're born to basically come to this planet and grow up and get indoctrinated into a cult and then you know just like fuck all day i mean <laughs> like that kind of is going to get boring after a while true i think it would too maybe what if it doesn't that's the danger. What if it doesn't, though? What if it's actually just... What if our ultimate doom is we we just create such a pleasurable existence that we stop doing anything? We just go all the way in. But then why would... Oh, God, I'm going to get woo now. Um, why would anyone want to, like, come and experience that as, like, a life? You know what I'm saying? Like, if... If and I don't know that you agree with this, but I'm going to say what I believe. If um, if you think that you know we choose kind of the life that we're born into to gain certain experience or whatever, like why would that be something that would be worthwhile to be born into? Wouldn't it just like die out as a civilization after a while? Just from like a higher level spiritual perspective, it's like okay, I can keep going back and just fucking and fucking, even though I know that this is just a lower form of existence. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Why? Why would it? You know what's crazy? Um, know. Have you ever heard of some of the um, the alien ex uh, abductee reports? Like they talk about their top, you know, there's there's these hybrid aliens that are, they say that the UFOs that are coming here, there's a whole race of them that are coming here. And the reason why they're abducting people and doing uh, hybrid stuff is because their civilization went through something like this and they lost the ability to reproduce. You know, they're coming creating hybrids with humans <laughs> because they lost their ability to naturally reproduce. So you want to hear probably the weirdest thing that I believe? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're... <laughs> um, I believe that I was abducted by aliens when I was a kid. <laughs> I really do believe this. I Let's really, go. really do. 
<laughs> and the reason is there's a couple reasons. So first of all, like my parents and this, I understand how stupid this sounds, but just go with it. Um, like my parents used to watch like unsolved mysteries every single effing week. It was always on. And so, Sweet. um, like my brother and I would watch with them and I love that stuff. Like I was raised on horror movies. Like I love horror movies. I love that sort of thing. So I've like, like super into all that kind of like mystery stuff, except when there was like an alien abduction episode or like a story or something, it wouldn't be just that I didn't like it. It would be that I was like, my whole body would start shaking. I would like curl up in the fetal position. I did not want to watch this. I would be scared for the rest of the night. It was like such an irrational fear that wasn't grounded in anything. And oh. so I, I very distinctly remember that from my childhood. And then I don't remember my dreams. Like I have a very, like every once in a while, I'll have like a really lucid dream or every once in a while, like I'll get a snippet of something but we're talking like maybe a handful of times a year. And I've like really tried. I've done like the meditations. I've done like the thing where you keep the notebook by the bed and you just like write down whatever you remember as soon as you, I've, I've tried everything. I cannot remember my dreams. And so for a long time I was thinking, I was like, is there some sort of thing where like when I was a kid, like I had some sort of encounter with aliens because like I would just I was always so terrified of that. And the day, the day they do something to my brain, which they wiped out my memory of it. And and then like I that and that's why I can't remember my dreams. They screwed something up in my head when they did that. And I was just kind of like positing about this for a couple of years and I didn't really think too much about it. But then um I got this psychic reading, like, I mean, like several years ago. I mean, this was must have been probably like, I don't know, eight, nine years ago or something. And basically, and it was one of those things that was like, it was out of nowhere in the context of like the psychic reading, but it said something to the effect of the greys on this planet want to thank Carlin for their service that she did to them when, when, when like they, they met her or something like that. And I was like, holy shit, the psychic is telling me I was abducted by aliens just like out of nowhere for no apparent reason. I was like, there might actually be something to this theory. I don't know. I've told it on stream. I got abducted too. But you I got abducted by aliens. Yeah. I, I was taken onto an alien spaceship during a, uh, essentially long story short basically an acid trip it wasn't acid but um yeah i had a psychedelic experience one of one trip that i had was different than all the others and i was it wasn't even really trippy it wasn't like a mushroom trip it wasn't all i would i literally just had an alien encounter what happened when i took this stuff which wasn't lsd guy that i got it from was some sort of experimental drug or something he said he doesn't know what it is it's just called paper he got it from a guy <laughs> okay and uh, <laughs> he, he was like it's not lsd but it's it came on paper tabs like lsd does he was like just take one he gave me a bunch but he's like just take one trust me only take one okay bro <laughs> so anyway i took it and what happened was aliens came into my room uh, scanned my body with some sort of device. I left my body and I, all of a sudden I was on like an operating table in a spaceship that was like on a metal table and they were all standing around me and they, and you know, what was crazy is, you know, who else was in the room? This girl that I had met one other time in my life, I met her at Mount Shasta and, um, she and I had like a special connection. I'll just say that. And then she was there. And she and I, like, gate, like, we, this was the psychedelic part, but, uh, she and I both gave birth to a baby on the spaceship. Like, we, be yeah, it was, I can't even explain it, but, like, we became one. We, like, united in one body, like, a, and then I felt the birth of the baby like i she i was her and she was me she gave birth but we were united as one person so i experienced it too and yeah like like the experience of an actual baby like my hips oh like i could feel the pelvic girdle opening and stuff and like wetness like a baby came out and the here's the crazy part all right so i a, after the trip i was like whoa 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 that was one of the that was the fucking weirdest different than all the other psychedelic trips I've ever had in my life. That's crazy. So I went back and talked to my, my dude who I got it from my friend went to his house later that week. And he goes, Hey Mike, did you take the paper? I'm like, dude, yeah, I did. 
He's like, what was it like? And him, I'm at his house and his girlfriend's right there. And I'm like, well, dude, honestly, it was the craziest trip I ever had, dude. I got abducted. I went to a sp- alien spaceship. He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, dude. And I gave birth to a baby. And he slaps his girlfriend in the arm and goes, I fucking told you. And the look on her face was crazy. She goes, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, I gave it. And he's like, I told you. Cause, and she tells me, she goes, I was in the room when he did it. And that's what happened to him too. The exact same experience wow. happened to him. He went to his space and he's like, yeah, I had a baby and his name is Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gave birth to a baby named Pedro and he's like, and, and he, the, his girlfriend was tripping out. Cause she's like, he hasn't been able to stop blabbing about his hybrid alien baby that he gave birth to on a spaceship. He's been bugging me about it all week. And here I come telling him I had the exact same experience when I took the thing. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So he just laughed his ass off. He's like, I fucking knew it. I told you. And she's been telling me I'm crazy all week. Same exact thing that happened to him. So uh, it was weird. <laughs> so yeah, well, anyway. I love how we've gone from a day of the rope to, uh, to your hybrid alien baby. <laughs> yeah. So I am a father of an alien baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you, I think Pretty you said cool. this to me, like when, when we very first started talking and I was just kind of like throwing stuff at you to see how you would react. And I think you actually threw this at me probably just to see how I would react. You were like, you said something to me like in a DM one time, like, yeah, I've got a hybrid alien baby. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was just, <laughs> that was real. But that was, you thought I was bullshitting. <laughs> I thought you were fucking with me just to see what I would do. Yeah. No, I, it's real. It's real. What's your alien kid's name? I don't know. I don't know their name. I didn't get that. That wasn't in my trip. But uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that someday when I get, maybe they're, maybe they're off there, you know, maybe they're out there growing up. Maybe they're looking out for me. Maybe I'll get to meet them someday. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Remember that time on the spaceship? That was really cool. Wow, my Earth Dad. This is so crazy. <laughs> Steve. Oh, I also had a, you know, uh, did I, just, I don't think you were around when I had my cat, but last year a cat spawned in my house. A cat spawned in your house. What does that mean? I came home one night and there was a cat in my house and all the doors were a little baby kitten, like barely old enough to be away from its mother all alone in my kitchen, doors closed, windows closed, no way in. There's a little kitty in my house and he lived with me for like six months. And then one day he disappeared. His name was Steve. Poor cat. Poor cat. So you just have all sorts of mystical stuff happening around you. Yeah. Mm. But that was cool. There are worse things. Maybe it was him. Probably. Maybe maybe that was my alien baby. And he was just like incarnated, disguised as a cat. He loved me. Oh, that could be. He was actually annoying how much he loved me. I always wanted to like come and like nurse on my neck. I mean, that says something. I've had mm-hmm. kittens that don't do that crazy about me that was probably it that was probably steve was probably my alien baby he just incarnated as a cat to come spend time with me makes sense i mean they say like you know like in like you know spiritual groups they say that like if a woman loses her baby like it'll come back in like a future baby like like if 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 a baby is meant to be born like whether you have it through like whether you have like a miscarriage or like an abortion or whatever like if it's meant to be born it'll come back in a in like a future child so is it out of the realm of possibility that you know if you had a hybrid alien baby somewhere that that consciousness you know exists somewhere and it could incarnate in another form makes sense that's cool i like that idea why not i'm for it why not Dude, if they can believe in Jesus, which is obviously made up by Jews, I can believe in whatever I want. Exactly. Nothing ever dies. We just change forms. We can come back anytime. It's different things. So, yeah, super 
super sex goon world. I think it's where we're going. I warned everybody in chat. <laughs> I hope not. Everybody who's watching my show, someday I'm going to have sex with you. Everybody who's ever watched my show, we're all going to hook up in a giant sex pile. I think that's a great idea. Nothing could go wrong with that plan. Yeah. So get your super I mean, chats are- in now if you want to be first in line. <laughs> if you want to get treated the <laughs> well, best. They are actually trying to do this, though. They, they're, we're working on a project in my, in my community to, like, document queer polyamory therapists because they're trying they they're all sorts of like fucking therapists that will just teach people how to be polyamorous and like you know help polyamorous couples cope with their polyamory and like all that stuff and it's like it it, 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 it's like a whole industry now and they're some of the craziest queer marxists you'll ever see jeez imagine they make money teaching people to you know basically embrace a sex-filled life with no consequence and no emotional attachment. <laughs> Sweet. You should check that out. You should send me some of those videos. I'll review them on the channel. That'll be fun. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to? Okay. Yeah, send me a couple of those. I don't know where to find them. All right. All right. Well, if I come across anything interesting, I'll send it over. Okay. Cool. Thanks for calling right. in. Thanks for reading. Thanks for reading uh, Day of the Rope. Thank you. Now, Let's do the, can we can we do the extremist book club? I want to do that. I really do. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking it'd be cool. Um, like I just had that little panel show. Adam wants to do an actual panel show. I think that's maybe that will be mine. Maybe we'll do a book review panel. Get some p- other people in on it. We'll all read a book and then just hang out and talk about it. Something weird. Okay. Day of the Rope would have been a good one to do. We can still do it. Yeah. Since you and I talked about it. Other people can talk about it too. That's and what I've I mean. Already done the work, so I just mean, yeah, we're I'm already happy. we're already kind of doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Excellent. Cool. Okay. See you. All right. Good night. Bye. Have a good one. Good night. Bye. <laughs> that was Doctor Carlin Barsenko, VIP guest at AFPAC Four, top Groiper general. Love you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye, darling. Darling.